Hey, welcome back to A Conversation With. My name is Philip DeFranco, and today we're having a conversation with Watsky, a.k.a. George Watsky. But a, a quick note before we get started, I just wanted to take a second to thank one of the sponsors of today's podcast, NordVPN.com slash Phil. You know, you, you want to be sure to secure your devices, access a global internet, and shield your browsing data through encrypted tunnels at NordVPN.com slash Phil. And on top of all that security and privacy for all your devices, they can also help keep you entertained by unblocking content on multiple platforms. So to protect your devices and stream what you want, where you want, just head on over to NordVPN.com slash Phil. But with that said, let's just jump into it. So what's up, man? <laughs> uh, a lot. I it's been a crazy like two weeks, three weeks since this whole fundraiser Guinness thing we did. I'm still feeling really good about it, and it's kind of crazy to have this personal success, my my world success, like my my band and crew, then in relief against all the fucked up stuff that's happening in the world. Well, actually, yeah, so you know, I'm I think personally, I think that could be like a good, good place to to start. Sorry about that. I know we got the little delay. Uh, I, I think that'd be a good place to to start. So part of the reason that I was like, oh, what you like popped up and everyone was like, Phil, you got to talk about this. And I didn't have a show that day. And I was like, no, I found out about it too late. Um, what is a uh, what's what did you just do with this? This awesome live stream? What did you you were raising money? Uh, can you kind of explain how what it was and how you started it? Yeah, so. For those of your followers who don't know what I do, I'm a musician and I do poetry and I play with a live band and my whole economic model as an artist is based around a big tour that I do every year. I, I love playing. I, I got a big squad I roll out with, like 10 of us in a tour bus and it's a high overhead thing. Um, but we have this core fan base that shows up and, and always comes and rocks with us and we had a big tour planned that just intersected with COVID in a head on collision. We, I, I booked these venues, like my dream venues a year and a half in advance. I had multiple night stands in certain cities in four different cities. I was going to be playing my album catalog each night, uh, in the city that I wrote that album in. And so awesome. this was a, an album tour that was crafted with a lot of love. And then five days before we, I, I had already done a week of rehearsal with my band. Uh, we had to pull the plug because the lockdown went into effect and it just dominoed this series of you know, unfortunate fallout effects that is really similar to probably what, what a lot of small business people went through where their whole business collapsed all of a sudden. So I had that on top of the fact that I don't know how much you've been following this, but Ticketmaster and all these companies that um, were holding on to people's tickets while trying to work through how to ethically provide refunds to people. I had all these fans who may be out of work, who needed refunds, who I felt like I was not properly servicing. And I felt really guilty about that. And I also felt like I had this choice whether to completely cancel the tour, lose 20,000 tickets for a lot of people who probably still wanted to ride with us and go to the show when it, when it happened. Um, so this fundraiser that we did two weeks ago was us saying, how can we knock down all these pins at once in the best way we can? And what, what can we do to attract a lot of attention on the internet? Cause we need to raise a lot of money. Um, I need to solve the tour uh, refund issue for my fans. And so we had this multi-pronged approach, like raise money for my band and crew, raise money for musicians in need and raise money for a fan fund so that we can personally pay out refunds and travel reimbursements to any fans who really need the money. And uh, so that's what we did. We decided we're going to set the Guinness world record for the longest freestyle in history. And at first we were like, that's kind of crazy. That that seems like a stupid thing to do. And then we thought, you know, actually the fact that we think that it's crazy is exactly why we should do it because it's interesting. And if it's not interesting, it's not going to get people's attention right now. So we did it. We spent weeks setting up the technical logistics and um, finally had the moment where we could do it. And, and it worked and we raised almost $150,000 and, uh, we have a, an email account for fan relief that we've now zeroed out and I'm feeling 
a lot better about that. Yeah, I think a lot of play, especially with a live stream that long, there, there's and with what you were doing, I imagine there were so many ways that it could have gone wrong. I was happy to yeah. see that it was a, a success. Well, but before this, what's the, the longest you you've ever freestyled? Oh, I mean, I I'm not a marathon freestyler. Like maybe a minute and a half, two minutes. I I do it for thirty seconds to make sure mentally, like, oh yeah, I I could keep doing this. So wait, it's, it's before not... you, before you did it though, did you like did you like go okay? I'm gonna practice for an hour, or you were like, no, I, I just have the blind confidence. I know me, <laughs> I could do this because I get yeah, that. Yeah, pretty much that's what it was. It was feeling like if you thir- if you freestyle c- continuously for thirty seconds or a minute, for me at least. I knew that it wasn't the ability to generate rhymes that was going to stop me. It was the stamina and the willpower to keep going. It, it became a complete just staying awake, uh, keeping my mind focused. And I knew that an hour versus 33 hours, I, I was just going to do this once in my life and I was going to put everything I had into it and then I was never going to do it again. And uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting knowing that, but I do feel like with all these perseverance kind of stamina exercises, your willpower and your motivation to do it is 99% of the battle. And I felt, I felt like I had a strong enough motivation that I'd be able to do it. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting. I'm I'm, I'm watching this show right now called Alone on uh, the History Channel, and it's got a lot of similar themes, which are the people who last the longest. These are people who get thrown into the wilderness and have to live by themselves until the last person drops and whoever drops last wins 500 grand or a hundred or a million dollars. Yeah. And the people who last the longest have family. They have people they need, they desperately need the money for to take care of. And the people who drop earlier are single people, uh, you know, and, and that I felt a responsibility. And I think that's, that's why I never would have done this. It was just like, let's set the record for no reason. Yeah, no, I mean, I I definitely, I feel that obviously it's different. I talked to someone recently that in the past had previously hated making their videos. They they didn't talk about it publicly. They hated it. And then they recently came back. They're thriving. And I was like, what? What brought you back? And they were like, honestly, I, I needed desperation. I needed the fact that like I dipped too far into my savings account. <laughs> to come back but it actually but i don't feel like i'm a slave to it i just needed that that fire i got complacent and so i I imagine pushing yourself having but also for your for your fans and regarding the Ticketmaster situation so because i know we covered this a while ago is a situation essentially that unless if if something's postponed the the tickets and the money are in limbo but if it's canceled that is when uh, a refund could be be put in place but you're saying you but a lot of people didn't want to cancel because a lot of people are waiting it out to see so like for, for me personally, and I'm going to refrain from, again, naming a specific company, although I already did, uh, you know, these, these are, these are important corporate partners of mine without whom I wouldn't be able to tour these amazing venues. And I got, I got to at least start with this caveat that these big companies, although they've made decisions that I have banged my head against the wall about, I know that some of these people in high up positions are thinking about supporting these massive payrolls of thousands of people and, you know, maybe worried about going into bankruptcy as a company and, and trying to keep their staffs from being furloughed. So I, I take their decisions with a grain of salt. But, but the original thing was we're not providing the refund option for postponed shows unless they have a new date scheduled. And making it very difficult for the artists to get those dates scheduled. So it was this public facing thing saying, Hey, once these artists reschedule their dates, we'll give you the refunds. But then from the artist end, we're talking to them being like, I will take a door deal. I will literally forego my financial guarantee and bet on myself and still not getting the dates rescheduled. So uh, it was it was a maddening position to be in and we felt like we had to do something on our end because we were waiting. We were waiting week after week being like, what's the deal? Can we get this tour back on the books? And um, now I think that we forced the hand a little bit. So they've, they've whitelisted our shows and we've gotten them rescheduled. But I think we only got that well, partly they were they were starting to unravel their situation and, and figure it out, but also we made enough noise that they paid some individual attention to our tour, even though it's not 
a big arena tour. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's important because I mean, I, I, I definitely hear your point of like, they have such a big company, they have their concerns. Also, it sounds like you're kind of, you're, you're an individual artist, so you have more room to navigate. Uh, but, but yeah, I think I, when we were covering the story and I was hearing, uh, yeah, the, the general gist of it and then other places like, yeah, we'll give you refunds, but it's actually, <laughs> it's actually just more money that you can buy on tickets whenever they're available again. Oh yeah. And I'm like, but don't, do you I also I control the price. The airline voucher. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting right now. This I I have strong opinions about the the ticketing and concert world. The there is essentially a, a monopoly or a duopoly like you have two huge companies and then a bunch of independents that are being battered against the rocks right now by COVID. And I really hope when we come back from this all the venues we love going to are I mean, a couple of them have fallen already, but we'll see what the post-COVID touring landscape looks like. Yeah, right, right now, has that has that started to develop? Are there kind of like murmurings of dates yet for you? I, I have my tour rescheduled, actually. Oh, okay. I, I put it on the books as we felt like we had to do that in order to move forward. But my message to everyone was, I, I can't say with 100% certainty that we'll be able to tour when this happens. If it gets postponed again, we'll either do the refund thing all over again mm -hmm. or trigger automatic refunds for everyone. Uh, but it's for it's for a year from now. It's for oh, the, spring okay. of, the spring of 2021, which when we started talking about that felt like a very conservative timeline and now doesn't feel so conservative anymore. Yeah, no, I mean, if anything, it sounds, yeah, safe. Even... I, I'm I'm not having to worry about live shows or concerts. Uh, for for us, we're trying to navigate uh, when we can have our son go back to school, especially because yeah. uh, once you're a parent, you realize just how easily everybody gets sick just because you have these like little spreaders <laughs> just oh, congregating sure. all day. Uh, so I, I I feel it in a different way. But yours yours I feel like is more stressful just because it's hundreds and thousands and thousands of people that you're responsible for. It was extremely stressful a few weeks ago, and now I feel – I mean, this this event that we did, this fundraiser, was one of the most powerful, positive, joyful experiences that, that I've had as a performer, like, ever. And I have – and also, and, and it floated my band and crew in a – we were almost able to pay my whole band and crew what they would have made on the tour if it had happened. Not not all the way, but, sure. you know, sub substantially close – and so I feel the huge weight off my shoulder that there's all these people that are counting on me that we, we let down and I'm, I'm finding ways to use the time. I'm learning guitar. I'm trying to write a book. I, I feel like personally good is going to come out of this for me, but I'm, you know, really upset about how it's going to potentially decimate an industry that I'm a part of and all, all the other industries and my friends and family and the world and the United States. And yeah, I think, I think on the global macro level, my, my troubles have gone from being very personal to being more citizens anxiety. What do you mean in that way? I mean, it's, it's not like just because my personal problems got solved momentarily by this fundraiser that the world didn't stop burning. I mean, literally burning in, in Minneapolis right now. Uh, so I mean, I'm still walking that tightrope between being an optimist and a pessimist and wondering if, you know, we're going to pull ourselves up out of this or if this is the beginning of the slow decline of our civilization. Uh, hey, no, I, I, I hear you. I, I feel I, I, every day I feel myself on the edge of just becoming a, a full on, what do they call them? Doomers. <laughs> yeah. I, think I was already going into this a cynic and I'm just I was like, yeah. Okay, this is the world is on par. I think that it is important, though, that yeah, we don't we don't discount kind of the uh, the unique uh, growth opportunities that pop up, especially. But I know that we don't want a lot of people don't want to talk about it just because it's like so many people are, including ourselves, are mentally suffering. Um, and then we kind of like get these glimpses of growth. You talking about trying to uh, to to get better with guitar stuff like that. I think I think even you doing the marathon. I think. Or SGN, which obviously a lot of people have feelings on of some good news selling out or not selling out, <laughs> selling. Uh, there's a unique opportunity uh, to do unique things. Um, it's yeah. like, but and, but I think it's noting that and also referring to it as a silver lining. You know, totally. It's, yeah, I, I I agree. I think I mean I feel this in my normal life too. I'm pre-COVID life, which is 
I personally feel like an adaptable person and like I have this personal philosophy about trying to make the best of a bad situation and trying to turn tragedy on its head and, and find out how, okay, the world's changed. How can I change in order to be realistic about the world that exists in it, but also not be one of these like hurt people up on a soapbox preaching to other people who might not have the same luxury that I have. So I, I would have friends in the past where I, I would have this blind spot and I'd be like, you know, shit just collapsed in your life, man. But, you know, look, look on the bright side, like, like I would or something. And that's, I'm not, I wouldn't say it exactly like that, but that was the subtext of it. And I think as I've grown up, I've learned that having, yes, do that kind of work personally, but understand that every person out there has different shit and might not be able to just find sunshine yeah. from from the darkness that no one wants to hear that when they're going through it yeah but i'm also yeah i'm, I'm personally a big believer in like f really feeling it when i'm yeah down like obviously like it sucks but really remembering what will hopefully in the future just be something that i went through right a rainy day uh yeah. but yeah hey okay so on a <laughs> less depressing topic <laughs> i i said to do this uh i have this little uh this game in front of me I, I somehow it's called the skin deep. It's a way for me to learn about you in a, in a way that's deeper than really the, the surface level stuff. Cause what in the past we we've come across each other a few times. We've chatted online a few times, but it, we nothing too deep. And so I kind of yeah. want to learn about you. So are you, uh, are you down for this? Hopefully eye opening game. I'm ready. Perfect. Okay. We're going to open up. We're going to open up. Hopefully helpful. What is the, uh, George, what's the, uh, the wisest thing? anyone has ever told you? Um, I remember being moved recently by the quote from the Dalai Lama that the point of life is to be happy. And that's, that's the one that's popping into mind right now. Yeah, no. And I, I, I would, I would agree with that. I had a, a phone call with a, a guy I hadn't talked to in probably like a year yesterday. And he was trying to figure out if he should quit a job with me having no information. I was like, what makes you happy, man? Are you going to one, obviously, are you going to die in three months if, if you leave this job, right? Because you have stability that a lot of people don't have right now. But just, yeah, what makes you happy? That's, and, and, yeah. if, and if you can't do it immediate, fucking game plan, like, uh, to, to, to get there. Because otherwise, even having the game plan, it's just like incremental boost from there, even if it's hard. And like you said, with leaning into the suffering, suffering gives meaning to joy. Without darkness, there's no light. If you don't have a context for what it means to feel crappy, like, how do you know how great it feels to feel great? Yeah, life is about the contrast. Yep. Okay, here we go. If you could go back and change one thing, what would it be? And this is with your life, um, not like not like go back and kill Hitler. <laughs> I wouldn't have jumped off a lighting rafter in 2013 in London. A lighting what? Uh, I I made the tabloids in 2013 in the UK because I I'd been climbing up things and jumping off them at my concerts and I I climbed up a really high thing and jumped off it and I heard a couple people and I would oh just no did I talk not. I might have talked about this maybe I don't know I mean it was like the top trending news story in the United Kingdom the day it happened but that was seven years ago and uh, you know that's one of those one off decisions where I don't think any I mean I maybe I wouldn't have learned where the line was but. I don't think that there's a lot of positivity that came from my decision to do that. So I would, I would specifically not do that. Okay. So you have personal <laughs> growth, but it would, uh, it would have still been a, a, a thing that you'd not, you, you decided to go back and not. It was personal growth that came at the cost of two other people's health. Yeah. And I would rather have my personal growth come at the cost of myself than mm. collateral damage of other human beings. I respect that. Okay. So I don't know if it's the same thing. Uh, describe a moment that you came close to closest to dying. Um, yeah, I don't know if that, that was it. I, I, I would say maybe I'm an epileptic and from time to time I pass out and start flopping around on the ground. <laughs> and, uh, how does I, that, how does that work if you're doing live shows? Do you have to go through specific things of what can't be done. You know, every epileptic has different seizure triggers and I don't have a flashing lights trigger. Okay. So that's never been an issue for me. Uh, I've also never had a seizure while I've been medicated on anti convulsants. So yeah, I, I had a, I I'm trying to remember the seizure that probably was the, the most dangerous. Um, I had one on the blacktop one time when I was a kid, I had one at the gym one time where there's a lot of metal 
things I could have hit my head on, Mm -hmm. uh, that, that maybe was, was it. Um, so yeah, one of those, one of those seizures, probably the one I had in 2014 while I was on, on the elliptical machine might've been the most dangerous one. Yeah. Cause you're just, yeah. you're just dropping into something already moving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it like moving metal pieces. I had an aunt pass away when her great aunt, uh, it runs in my family and she hit her head on a bathtub. She did. She was a freshman at Sarah Lawrence did not oh, wow. survive the, the event. So that's the most dangerous thing to look out for when you're when you're having a seizure, not hit your head on something. So, I mean, as long as you remember, have you always known or was there like kind of a, a distinct moment where you had this this seizure and you learned about it that way? I had the first one in seventh grade when I was running the presidential fitness mile in gym <laughs> class. Oh, no. <laughs> and I was in my San Francisco Unified School District uniform and I uh, and I woke up in the hospital and I, I, you know, it's, it's really interesting because I think about this tendency in me that was also the reason that I felt like I could do the rap marathon, which is I, I generally want to push things beyond where I should and, and I'm, have a sort of switch in my brain where I, I have an override button where I'm like, yeah, my body's telling me to stop this right now, but I don't really want to stop. So I'm just going to kind of plow through. And, and I think that's one of the reasons I have seizures. I had it on the elliptical machine. I had it running the mile in gym. And I was worried about having a seizure at the end of this rat marathon because I was sort of taxing my my body so much. And that's that's when seizures happen for me is when I sort of push past the moment where my body is screaming at me to stop doing something. You made me feel less shitty about being the, the kid that walked it. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted it. I wanted that president, you know, and then this is, this is maybe a character flaw or something. I'm, I, I am highly competitive and I, uh, I wanted that gold foil certificate from George Bush. <laughs> it's like, it's very few people actually got it. Cause I think a lot of people, especially early on, it was like the, the pull-ups that would fuck people up. I think. Yeah. There's the pull-ups, there's the flexibility ch- challenge. Um, I am also not fast and I was trying to be fast and I, you know, I, I've done athletics. I've always been the kid who like had the most grit. I'd get the sportsmanship award. I'd get the grit award, but I was not good at sports. So I think I, I was trying to go against, you know, God or whoever you believe in the, the spaghetti monsters will by trying to for, force this issue. <laughs> <laughs> but then you learned. Well, actually, yeah, wait, I, so did you, were you quickly put on medication after that or? Cause I, I know I had a second. So, so they didn't put me on meds right away. I had another seizure two weeks later at a bowling alley. We had a, we have a Japan town in San Francisco and I was there with some friends and I had a seizure and they thought I was faking. So they started kicking me. <laughs> oh and then and this is seventh grade still. Then after that second seizure, I had to go on a medication called Depakote, which made my cheeks swell up like a chipmunk. It was not what I wanted in seventh grade. That's that's the and, thing is like for people that never uh, haven't gotten on any sort of medication yet, like the <laughs> the side effects are such a massive part of every fucking oh. medication. Anticonvulsants are no joke meds. They're they're they also double as antipsychotics. They okay. they prescribe them to people with bipolar issues because they're basically like if, if people know what an audio compressor does, it takes the, the audio wave and it squashes the peaks and it squashes the valleys and that's what an anticonvulsant or a mood stabilizer does to your brain waves. It takes the peaks and it takes the valleys and it goes, and, uh, there's a lot of, you know, like I felt, I felt like a zombie when I was on some of those drugs and I've, I've been on a lot of different ones. And does it just take like years and years and years of like testing things on and off until you're like, okay, this is the yeah. closest to what I would consider normal. I have my, my personal opinions about anticonvulsants, which my, my opinion is that for me, the oldest one, this drug called phenytoin, which uh, is now a, the generic of that, that drug, is actually the best one. It has the least messed up side effects. Now, there are probably people in your audience who might take different, more, more recent designer drugs that work better for them, but I have a feeling that a lot of these drugs that come along, they haven't been in the market as long. They're, they're not generic yet. So the pharma companies push them because they can charge 
way, way, way more money for the drugs that haven't gone generic yet, but they're actually not as good as the old warhorse drug that they made in the 50s. And, and some of these new ones, um, you know, really, really messed me up and freaked me out, made me feel like a, like a hollow person. <laughs> so I'm on a low dosage of, of that drug phenytoin now. With the, with the ambition to to someday wean myself off it, but it's for for an epileptic that's a com that's a complicated choice to make because if you get behind the wheel of a car you're uh, you're putting people at risk besides yourself and you never know when you might have one of these. Well, because yeah, so I mean, with that, I don't know if we're getting too personal. Is that something that like a, a doctor has said? Yes, this is a a thing that you could do. Um. It's tough because there's liability issues for the doctors mm. to recommend that. And so their their advice is almost always conservative. Uh, I have an, a neurologist who thinks that the dosage I'm on of phenytoin that I've, I've been on at this level, which is uh, 200 milligrams a day, is is a sub, sub-therapeutic level, which is too low mm-hmm. in her, her advice. Um, but it's a level at which I feel... Like I don't feel the warning signs of seizures popping up, and I also feel like myself. Uh, so it's it's a very tough personal choice to decide what to do, how to do, and you know you could you could be off meds for thirty years and then have a seizure, and if you have it at the wrong time, you know there's there I don't know. I have an anecdote, a historical anecdote that, that I find interesting. I don't know if we're fear, veering too off topic. Here. No, I love it. There's no topic. Uh, okay. You're the topic. <laughs> so, so there's 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 a guy named Harry Laughlin who in the 30s, 40s, he was in charge of this thing called the Eugenics Records Office in the United States. This was before World War II and before the United States had decided that maybe eugenics aren't such a good thing. And uh, he was really into sort of, you know, like – Nazi-esque, perfect race kind of shit. And, and one, and the thing is he, he lumped epileptics into that category and there was, uh, involuntary sterilization of thousands of people in the United States in, in those decades, people that were in like undesirable categories, which could include felons, gay people, people with epilepsy, other genetic disorders, uh, and Harry Laughlin, this guy who ran the office out of, out of, um, Long Island, New York was an epileptic. He was a secret epileptic. He was a self-hating epileptic. And he, he got like an honorary degree from the university of Heidelberg by the Nazis and stuff for like his contributions to race science and stuff. Uh, and you know what, this guy died. This is not confirmed, but it is, it's the belief because he would have seizures in front of his staff and, and hide it. He died behind the wheel of a car. He drove it off a cliff and nobody knows why. And it's assumed that he had a seizure. Wow. And it's it's just crazy to me, you know, the self-hatred and the um, ways that it's sort of played in history. And, and, and my aunt in those decades that Harry Laughlin was a dude, this, this woman, Polly, um, had her seizure. She was a freshman at Sarah Lawrence studying chemistry. And I believe that this is kind of confirmed by family details that she wasn't well medicated because it wasn't considered socially acceptable at that point in history to be an epileptic. And she was studying like chemistry of all things. Um, yeah, I just find it fascinating. I I didn't really have a a, a main point, but I I just, I find this dude, Harry Laughlin, such an interesting archetype of this guy who spends his life and, and, and kind of like, you know, evangelical pastors who turn out to be be gay and, and sure. hate themselves for being gay that that it, it's just so unfortunate that we you know haven't reached a point where you could just be yourself it's okay like yeah love I mean, yourself it is yeah that i feel it it's one of those weird things especially with kind of the last thing you talked about of it's like sometimes you see it and you'll think it but then it's like you're like, can I say it? Because then people are going to potentially take it as me saying that it is a negative, but that's not the point that you're making. You're so, it's just that someone hates themselves so much because they have such a negative connotation or they have so much to gain. Because a lot of the, yeah. especially out of that, that latter group, there's a lot to gain from, from pushing shit that, yeah, that, that you are. Or, or pushing yeah. stuff against of what you are. Um, so I guess for you then, are you, I mean, if, if there is a time, and this is not me making a recommendation for you or anyone else, it feels like if there was a time, now is a good age of Uber elevators. <laughs> you don't have to work out, but 
<laughs> Maybe you could do so yeah. in a safe way if you if you switch things up. Yeah, no, in fact, I moved to New York in 2016 for a year, partly because I figured I could live there and take the subway right. and not be on meds. And I ended up having another seizure about a year after that and deciding that I wanted to drive. And that was more important to me than going off the meds. But yeah, the, the Uber has created a world, at least in Los Angeles, where, you know, I, I had the, the beginnings of my seizures coming back and the beginning of ride sharing mm -hmm. coming around around the same time. So there was a period where I wasn't driving and where ride sharing didn't exist yet. And I was living in LA and I was trying to take the blue Santa Monica bus for like, you know, I would, I would connect in Echo Park if I wanted to get the east side to Santa Monica, it'd take me three hours. And, uh, and ride sharing came along and made LA a livable place for someone who wasn't driving. So absolutely. I think it's going to depend to me. Like, you know, I, I really value being able to get around in a car and I like to drive. So, you know, maybe at some point in the next few years, I'll decide I'm hunkered down somewhere trying to write a book. I just want to post up and I'll give it a shot and see, see what my body's telling me, get off the meds. Yeah. That's interesting. All right. Another one. Oh, this will be, this will be potentially eye opening, or maybe there won't be something. If your if your ex was here, what would they warn me about you? Uh, I'm trying to think of, of a particular, of, of an ex that would warn something specific. Um, maybe that I'm, I can sometimes focus so much on fairness that I can, I can be a person who's like very Virgo with, I like bean counting, you know, you didn't do this. I did this, uh, like, you know, that, that my fairness desire for like justice and relationship equality can sometimes become, uh, you know, un, uh, yeah, like, like I'm doing too much bean counting. Okay. So it's like, if you, so if how, yeah, could you give me an example of what that would look like? Like, Hey, like you, you, I took out the trash the last two days. So I'm, are you, are you, you going to do it? <laughs> do you feel like it's because uh, you feel like you're being taken advantage of or what do you mean? I think so. I think that I have some chip on my shoulder or something like, like in the past I felt, felt taken advantage of. And so that I have like a very sensitive trigger for that stuff. And sometimes I'm also not looking at myself in the, like, like maybe I have a tendency to give myself too much credit for the stuff that I'm doing and, uh, you know, not seeing the bigger picture. But I do think I am I am sensitive when it comes to that, and I, I I don't know exactly where that comes from. Some probably deep repressed childhood thing where I felt like I was the nerd who wasn't getting picked for kickball or something. So I always feel like I'm not getting a fair shake. <laughs> well, I was gonna ask. I was like, do, do you feel like it, it? Like I don't know. I don't know like your relationship history, but do you feel like you've been in relationships where you just had thoughts or discovered that a person was in it for the wrong reasons? Um. I've been in some, some wonderful relationships. I've been every, every relationship I've been in has been both wonderful and not wonderful uh, for different reasons. <laughs> well, if you're not in it, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, but no, I mean, I've also been in, in relationships with people that just was the wrong point in time in my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't line up and we were never going to line up, but it was great for what it was when it was. Um, the original question was, what would an ex warn me about? Yeah. Um, I'm tr trying to think of other things. I've gotten better at some adulting things that maybe early on I wasn't, wasn't so good at. Um, yeah, I, I can, I, I have trouble sometimes expressing emotion. I really want to be able to be able to cry more. And it's hard. It's really hard for me to, to go to that place. I've got a big, I got a big wall up of, wanting and, and this is maybe the part of me that's like push through dust yourself off don't let life kick your ass and knock you down i, I really don't want to be defeated by things um but i think that that has created a skin where i have a lot of trouble going into that really vulnerable place when, when do you think was the last time you cried i mean i cried last night while watching the guy win alone for on the history <laughs> channel <laughs> you're like I know, but seriously, tears, tears were streaming down my face. And that was the first time that I had that happen in a long time. Uh, that's like, just, honestly, that's like half the reason I watch movies. Cause when you say like you have a hard yeah. time crying, I a thousand percent, I don't know the last time I cried for me. 
I like, I yeah. don't, I, but, but I was like, but I don't I, either. Yeah, but I was like, I watched, I, I watched Schindler, Schindler, Schindler's List for the first time a week ago. One, because I was like, how have I not seen this fucking movie? And then two, I was like, Liam Neeson's gonna make me cry. And uh, and yeah, as he as he does, I I did cry for myself back when that stage dive thing happened in 2017. I I cried in front of my band. Um, other than that, I I can't remember the last time that I cried for me and uh, and or, or like had those really like mm. racking sobs that you have when you're a kid. And I would like to. I, I think it would be really healthy. It's just not easy for me. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I definitely get that. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, for me, for... Actually, wait. So, yeah, me crying for me three <laughs> three years ago. And I think it was... It, the moment that I knew that it was real or, like, it was going to be something that was too much was when you kind of talk about, like, as a kid, when you go... <gasps> like, you, oh, like, yeah. kick... <laughs> like, breath, breath can't even calm you down. Convulsions. You lose again. Yeah. I want to laugh like that too more often. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. The, the extremes, the extremes, I yeah. think it helps ground us. All right. So actually uh, a question that popped up that, that connects to it. What, what do you do that detracts from the relationships in your life? I think my biggest addiction is to work too hard. I, I'm a workaholic and I've, I think I really have in the last few years been able to make more space for the other relationships in my life, both romantic. I'm, I'm in a great two year relationship with my girlfriend, Amber, who I really love. And it's just such a positive, mutually supportive relationship. Um, so I, I do feel like I invest heavily now in my romantic relationships and, and, and my friendships. I have, I have awesome friends from college, high school, the spoken word poetry scene that I grew up in in San Francisco. And, um, and I do feel like me and my friends, we invest in each other, uh, in terms of specific things that detract from them. I don't know. I, I think I'm, I think I'm a pretty good friend. I try to, I try to give what I want to receive in, in my friendships. That's I, I'm good, sure there's man. something, something I'm not thinking of. No, that's good. I, uh, I, I admire that. I, I have to like make an active, active effort to not be a shitty friend. Uh, I'm yeah. like. I'm uh, bipolar is probably not the r the right word, but I'm very like uh, I'm either all like I'm like making the most effort or forgetting your birthday. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I definitely have those moments. I I should get my friends' birthdays written down in my calendar because I keep telling myself that, I'm like just just yeah. it's Google Cal. It's easy. I think I could just connect it to Facebook. It'll be great. That was half the I reason keep, I had Facebook. I keep a physical calendar because I've done that for like 15 years and I, I buy the same one every year. It's a monthly calendar. So I see the whole month spread out and I carry it around in my backpack. It's, uh, it helps me to write them down. And I would it would be very easy for me to take 30 minutes, go through my best friends, write all their birthdays down and I'd remember it when you're when you're writing not specifically this but when, when you're writing songs is it is it something where you're just freestyling or and, and to yourself and you're like okay I'll, I'll write it down or um you know are you at a computer or are you at a like do you actually have a notebook and a paper or in a, pe and a pencil i try to mix it up i write i write at my computer a lot and i listen to whatever beat or so song fragments i'm working on or if it's an essay or a poem a that it's just the, me and the word doc staring at each other. But I do try to have times where I'll, this is not as true in COVID, but leave the house, put my headphones on and walk around with a pad and paper. And I always try to have like a little moleskin on me. So that if I have an idea, I can write it down. I, I prefer to write those ideas down in a little notebook than in my iPhone for some reason. But, and, and for yeah. you, what, what kind of comes first? Do you think that, you just in, in the kind of, are you writing down something and kind of avoid, or I know you mentioned a beat. Is it any particular beat or the one you spe specifically want to put words on? It depends. What, when I'm working on an album, I view the creation of the album, like backing into an extremely tight parallel parking space, which means that you have to try different ways to get in and nudge yourself in. And sometimes you overcorrect in one direction and you need to recorrect in the other direction. And it's only by making big changes at first and then increasingly smaller changes to really refine it at the end that you're really able to get snugly into that space without 
totaling the cars in front and behind you. And, um, and so for me, that means trying different things at the beginning and really having a, a wide open creative period when you're first doing the broad strokes of that project where you're trying everything. You're starting with chord progressions and putting lyrics on top of them. You're starting with um, fragments of words and then seeing if they fit melodies. You're starting with ideas and seeing if those can manifest the song. And, um, and usually for me, about two thirds of the way through an album, I really figure out what the album's about. And then the last third of the process is me filling in the blanks, making, removing parts of it that don't serve the project. And for instance, this, this most recent album that I've been working on is, um, is about my experience growing up in San Francisco. And I am doing a three album trilogy that I started three years ago and didn't know exactly what it was going to be, except that I knew. So rewinding, I, I came off of a, an album that I did in 2016 called times infinity that had 18 songs on it. It was the most maximalist thing I could have done. It had crazy song concepts four minutes songs, 10 minute songs, a song suite at the end that was like having an overarching narrative and then a bonus track at the end that was 20 minutes long that had nine guest rappers on it. And it was just like, the, it was like me trying to do the most with an album. And I came and I worked on it for two years and I came off that being like, I can't keep doing this. This is like not a sustainable practice. I'll only tour every three years. But I, but I also felt like I wanted to continue to escalate my creativity and make it more ambitious than the project before. I think that's, so, sorry, I just, I think that's actually healthy. I think you being able to acknowledge this is, too, this is too much, but I think that there is at times something incredibly beneficial to emptying the tank, uh, yeah. like just getting every, every fucking thing out. Uh, it's rebuilt. Yeah. I mean, the build, rebuilding process can be hard, but I totally respect that. But yeah, keep going. Sorry. And, yeah. And, and I was living in New York, like in this you know, non medicated period. And, uh, that, so that, that was that, that experience, but my solution to wanting to escalate creatively, but not want to kill myself over emptying the tank every two years was to create an album series that my fans didn't know it was an album series until they started to see the different pieces emerge. So I decided because I love language and puzzles that I would work with a linguist, uh, data scientist, and I would come up with an algorithm that would help me title this album series in a way that would interlock with itself. Uh, the first album came out and had big block letters on, on the front. Each, each album has nine letters in the title. And the first one was complaint. And the second one is placement. And they all have three columns and three rows of this big block text and also art and the covers that interlock with each, each other. Each album is nine songs and when I worked with this linguist, we plugged the rules of this word puzzle into the English dictionary, and it only spit out one possibility of nine letter words that interlocked in the way we wanted it to. There was literally one, if I wanted to, to follow this thread, there was only one, one solution. And, and I'm not a religious person. I'm not a person who believes in fate, but I am a person who believes in seeing an awesome opportunity to do something insane and saying yes to it. And these words were given to me before I knew what the albums were about. And I used those words as an unpacking process. What does complaint mean to me? What does the word placement, which is the second one that I'm in right now, mean to me? And and I found a huge amount of meaning unpacking those words. And, and it's really become this like crazy life experience, like growth experience. And the album trilogy has become this whole cathartic thing about like growing into this album trilogy. It's given me, you know, four years of creative material that I'm able to roll out sequentially. And, uh, I can't wait for the third one. I'm, I'm trying not to say the word. Some of my fans have figured it out already, but, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. That sounds like it's a, it, it sounds like it's a journey of the discovery and probably processing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's therapeutic. Uh, it's not something I've heard of another artist doing, which is always exciting for me when I'm like, you know, this is, this is a unique way to structure a project and, and it's going to come up with a result that 
And it, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know the word for this kind of interlocking word puzzle. It doesn't exist. That's, that's really awesome to me. And is that something that you've communicated to the audience or is that like kind of a, a thing that they've discovered on their own? I mean, I've, I've been like this conversation with you has some pieces in it that aren't things I've articulated before because I've wanted this, the discovery process on their end to be there, to be satisfying, to be reveals that actually have weight and impact to them. Uh, I think that them figuring parts of it out themselves is more rewarding than mm-hmm. me just explaining a hundred percent of it. So I'm, I'm holding back some of the meaning that I have personally, but it is, it is a pro it's been a process of like, how much information do I give at any particular time that won't, that won't minimize the impact that I want the reveals to have right. that, that album complaint that I did, which was about a complicated romantic relationship I was in a couple years ago, uh, as a standalone piece, didn't really say as much as I wanted it to in the context of the whole three. And I really had to bite my tongue and, and be like, you know, I'm going to let the, let my fans have their own opinions about why it's not their favorite piece of work of mine, because I have a rock solid belief that when they see it in the context of the three album trilogy, they're going to understand why it's not as, as shallow a project as they think it is. Mm-hmm really have to hold back. You know, I'm sure you have these moments when you see something on the internet that you really want to, you really want to engage in, <laughs> but you know, yes. you know, you know, you know, it, it's, it's not the thing you can, you know, you can't, you can't bite back there. No, I mean, yeah, even, even today, which I mean, people don't, who aren't going to know when I was filming this, uh, it's like the things that I don't engage in, that's actually probably the place that I've grown the most. Uh, yeah. cause yeah, it's, it's, it's often, it, I have to think of like, what's the benefit here? <laughs> what's the benefit uh, in any way? But okay, wait. The last time I, I remember really laying into someone on Twitter, uh, they they said something about my tour manager coming out to grab a bottle of water on stage and something that I felt like was mean and and sort of dehumanized my tour manager. And I was like, you motherfucker, you piece of shit. Like, who do you think you are? Like, give me a break. Like, and, and then the mom of the kid responded to me saying like, my son has Asperger's and he loves you. And this devastated him. And <sighs> he'll, and he will never listen to your music again. We can, like, and I was just like, my my balls just like you got one of the you got you got you got you got one of the the worst you don't know what someone else is going through moments (laughs) just thrown at you but it was so illuminating i remember every time i think about like who is who is this person here how who would say that to me i remember that moment and i think like you don't fucking know like you just don't know you know that 90 percent chance they're an asshole but that 10% chance is real. And, and, you know, Ooh, man, that I used to think, yeah, when I was growing up, the, the worst thing was like, if you do a, your mom joke and they're like, my mom's dead. That is the, what you there did you is go. a whole different level. Hey, I hope you're enjoying another special quarantine version of the podcast. Uh, I just want to take another second to thank one of the sponsors of this episode of a conversation with Babbel. You know, right now, a lot of people are stuck uh, in self quarantine, stay at home. People have more time on their hands than they know what to do with, and that can kind of be soul sucking. So, if you're looking for something new, and maybe you're not a, a plants person, my wife definitely is now, uh, if you're not a video game person like I am, uh, that is where Babbel comes in. With Babbel, learning a new language and broadening your horizons is so incredibly easy. And that's because Babbel is designed to quickly get you speaking your new language within weeks with their daily 10 to 15 minute lessons. Also, Babbel teaches real life conversations, not just simple words and phrases, because learning is accelerated through interactive dialogue. All of their lessons are thoughtfully created by over 100 language experts and not some translation machine. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, German, and more. One of the best features is definitely their speech recognition technology. It helps you improve your pronunciation and accent so you can make sure that you're doing it right. And Babbel is also available both as an app and online, so your progress will be synced across all your devices. And right now, Babbel is actually offering our listeners three months free with a purchase of a three-month subscription with promo code Phil. So go to Babbel com. Use your promo code Phil on your three month subscription. And in case you need it again, that's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com. Promo code Phil. That's my name. We made it easy. Babel. Language for life. OK, but back to the podcast. What do you think is your biggest fear and why? Uh, death. I'm <laughs> just death. <laughs> I have a I have a a 
paralyzing fear of my own mortality that probably is the root cause of everything that's good and bad about me. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think is more frightening? The fact that what do you think is more frightening that everything ends or everything continues forever? <laughs> uh, well, it's, everything continues forever without me. Like what the hell? <laughs> Come on, let me come to the party. Okay, so um, so the so the the emptiness, the blackness, the void. I, yeah, the fear of the unknown. Growing up agnostic, uh, with parents who, who instilled in me the very compelling belief that we probably end existence as we began it before with some blank slate of TV static and nothingness. Uh, I have no proof of that. I, I cannot, I don't have any interest in arguing with any of you on the internet about whether that's true or not. It's just what I'm just, I that's the name of the, that's the name of this likely. podcast. George, George Watsky doesn't believe in God <laughs> and he, and, and, and he hates me, you. <laughs> please don't send me a specific Bible verses to convince me otherwise. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, I have, I have a deep anxiety about the unknown and what comes beyond. And, and I really know that I need to deal with this in a meaningful way if I'm, I'm going to, be the person I want to be. No, we all but stay on I the treadmill really, and look at Twitter and look at the TV to, to not have that feeling. And then every now and then, once every two years, we have <laughs> we get we get the the world falls on top of our chest and we're like, <gasps> my uh, actually the last time I thought about this was uh, probably a few months ago. My 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 son <laughs> asked me uh, about death. And he was like, so yeah. like, so like, do we respawn? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, you've been watching too many video game videos. Um, I was like, some people think so. Some people think that I try to like explain like a lot of people think a lot of different things. And I was like, this is what mommy and daddy think. Uh, yeah. and, and now he has it in his head. Like he had a, he had a freak out moment, but now he has it in his head that he has to, <laughs> he has to get really good at science so he can develop a potion that keeps everyone alive. Bless his soul. Bless his soul. Uh, that's that's uh I'm pretty sure that's a central plot to Harry Potter and <laughs> many of the other great works of of literature. I don't know. I I think that's a dangerous road to go down the cryogenics uh let's right. let's I mean I think Steve Aoki has like a cryogenics chamber or something. It's it's tempting. Have you seen a but, have you seen this uh show on <laughs> I feel lame saying it, uh, on Amazon Prime called Upload? No. So it's this whole. Oh, do you upload your consciousness? And yeah, it's like it's like if you're if if they if you think you're gonna die instead of like I'm gonna cry get cryogenically frozen frozen they uh, they essentially zap your head, <laughs> burn it mm -hmm. off, and then you end up in a a computer system same as you. Uh, definitely, yeah. definitely not a a copy, but definitely you, your soul. Yeah, it's like that San San Junipero Black Mirror episode. Yeah. I don't know. I just think that all those like those thread threads to pull on, whether it's uploading your consciousness or immortality through youth, any, any kind of stuff, stuff like that. It's, it only lasts so long. And at, at the end of it, you still have hard drives degrading. You still, no matter whether you live a hundred years or a million years, at some point, I do think every person has to confront the fact that that death is a reality and that all those other things are ways to get away from having to accept that. And those are not uh, like like any kind of immortality solutions are not going to lead me to solving the the deep black void inside me somewhere. That it's it's by actually confronting mortality that I'm going to be able to deal with some of my issues. All right. So, so. then, a uh, question I'll ask you: If you uh, if all of a sudden we we finish up this podcast, you get a you get a text it says Grim Reaper, you have three years left to live. What do you what do yeah. you think that you would be doing differently? Than you're doing now. If I if I knew my expiration date, yeah, three years from now. Um, I think that I would really stop doing any car career ladder climbing stuff. Um, maybe I would focus post COVID on traveling and spending time with my mom and dad. But it's an interesting question because usually I think the answer that I have to that is all stuff that when I really think about it, I should be doing anyway, that, you know, my parents aren't going to live forever. I'm not going to live forever. So why not just give up your egotistical ambition now and live that life? Well, cause I was, life. I was going to, yeah, I was going to ask you, I was like, cause it, you know, we started off the podcast and you said like the most important thing is happiness. Yeah. So it sounds, and I think, I think the answer is because I have weakness and ego and 
And we live in Los Angeles, California. <laughs> that is the, the, the absolute quintessence of those things. How, uh, you know, and, how often do you see your parents? And in, in, let's say like a year. Um, probably four times and talk to them every two weeks. And how old are they? My dad is 77 and my mom is 70. My yeah. dad's 78. I was watching the a, other, I was watching a video. Yeah. I was watching a video the other day and someone was talking about like, you know, being happy, uh, caring about family. And they're like, you know, what are your parents? And they said something actually, I think similar. They were like 70 and they were like, okay, let's say they live 20 more years. And they're like, you have, so you think that you have your parents for 20 more years. And it was, I'm mentioning this because it put a lot of stuff in, into kind of frame for me. And, and you're like, but you don't have your parents for 20 more years. You have your, yeah. your family for, or your, your parents for four times a year times 20, right? You have your family for 80 more visits. Would that change, would that change what you do in your day to day? And it's like, oh yeah, yeah drastic. Like once, once someone kind of like throws your life and your experience in, in that kind of like quantifiable way. It's like, it's so weird. I think that we as humans in order to live and do the things we need to do to survive have an amazing ability to rationalize and to know that we're going to die, but not to really internalize it. And we have a compartmentalization of our brain that, that really doesn't believe it. And thinks <laughs> how, that we're, how could we're this not forever. be? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's what led, lets us, do all the dumb shit that humans do all the time and not be kind to each other. And that's, that's where my, you know, like I, I feel like if we all walked with that, like intense gratitude for our mortality all the time, people wouldn't be flipping each other off in traffic or doing all the little things, you know, like it, it's never going to happen, but that, that is where it comes from. And, uh, I don't know. Do you, are your parents still alive? Yeah, they're still alive. No. And so the reason I asked that is cause it like made me think about, cause I see my parents less. Um, yeah. and so I was just like, Oh man, like what, what is that? Yeah. I was like, especially so after, after hopefully everything calms down with COVID and, and solutions are found and there's a new normal or a return to normal, like what would I be doing differently? And I think that's also, yeah it's it's in some way how i'm kind of forced to try and make myself think of the time of like how can i be better right yeah. now that now that uh for me even though i'm still working and still keeping everything going like what i don't i don't want to do what i was doing before this right it gave me how how so like in what way for you for to the point of family right i uh i think you know growing up i had like i was i was shipped kind of back and forth between my mom and my dad um, I never really had any roots anywhere. The closest I've had to roots is actually California, which is weird for me. Cause I'm like, Oh, I guess I'm a Californian cause I've lived here the longest. It's, it's where it's like where everyone I know is, well, not everyone I know. I talk to a lot of people, but it's, it's home to me. But I made like an active effort to stay away from family. Cause on my mom's side, <laughs> she's got like uh, a shit ton of brothers and sisters and it's just chaos. And whenever I see them, it's always like gossip and drama and just, uh, I was like, just things were, cause my, my childhood was very much defined by the fact that I did not have control. And mm -hmm. even with me kind of, uh, my, my original, when I was born, I was Philip Franchina. Philip DeFranco initially started a stage name and I changed my name officially for a number of reasons, but also because I met, I felt like a different person, you know, I, mm -hmm. I had control. Um, and, uh, but a lot of that control stemmed from the fact that I was away from my family. Uh, and cause I, I, whenever, you know, whenever you, there's this ability, I don't know if I wouldn't say it's necessarily true now, but there's, there's a tendency for, I think a lot of people, when you go back home, you're the kid again, some fucking how, like you're a grown ass sure. person. And all of a sudden you're like, mom, dad, <laughs> like, uh, unless, uh, some people, you know, pivot the other way where all of a sudden they feel like the parent and sometimes that's valid. Um, but yeah, I uh, but I'd, I'd definitely like to spend more time with uh, my dad, and my stepmom, and my stepsister, uh, and those kind of things. Just because, yeah, who fucking knows how long any of us have? Yeah, that's it. Amen. Well, so I, I do think, yeah, if that comes out of COVID, that we appreciate our friendships and our family more. That that is a silver lining. Maybe, you know, who who knows how long those moments of gratitude will last? But we can try to actively hold on to them. Plus, in December civil war it's happening <laughs> oh man that's that's the date that's the date that you think it's going to go down when when it's going to go full-on armed conflict december 
12th. <laughs> okay. So we, we have a week this. to get no. our Christmas shopping in. <laughs> Two weeks. All right. So I've been asking a lot of negative questions. What do you, uh, let's start with this one. What do you love most about your, your friends? Um, man, I have awesome friends. I, I have different friend groups that don't really interact with each other because I got my high school friends and my college friends and my, my poetry world that's kind of separate. But um, I think that probably speaks I, to you being a decent person if you're able to still have high school friends. I was like, I fucking hate all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we talk a lot. We go to weddings and stuff for each other and they're pretty cool folks. I I think I appreciate that they check in with each other and that unlike at some points in high school, we don't, you know, try to pick apart each other's weaknesses and use that to rag on each other. Mm -hmm. Um, I appreciate that they're not in my industry all the time, that most of my friends are in other fields, architecture, finance. uh, You know, I, I like being able to ask them about their careers and they ask me about my careers and we're not constantly playing like inside baseball with each other. I dig that. Okay. So then I'll go, I'll go with another kind of three question. What are your three biggest pet peeves? Uh, I'm going to have to think about this because I don't really have like a Rolodex of things that annoy me off off the top of my head, but I'm sure you know what I don't like. I don't like fake laughter. I I really don't like it when people laugh at things that I can tell they don't find are funny because they're they're forcing a laugh okay so wait then question when if you see a clip of jimmy fallon do you think that it's fake and you get angry or do you think he is gen genuinely one of the happiest men on the planet i don't know if he's happy i don't believe that jimmy fallon's probably one of the happiest guys on the planet i don't know maybe he is i think there's probably a bigger possibility that he came up doing improv and comedy and he realized that laughter is infectious and that when he started laughing, other people started laughing because if you go to an improv show, you love to see the people break on stage. Mm-hmm. It's and it and it makes people crack up. His job is to make people laugh. And I think he knows and he's done it for so long that it probably is is in him. Mm-hmm. Like he, he knows how to tap into his laughter center and that it makes him a very congenial like person to watch. So, yeah, I I find his laughter real he seems he doesn't if he's faking it he's faking it so well that i don't care um but yeah when you got you know in a social situation and somebody is just like you can tell that they just are so uncomfortable that they're using their fake laughter as a way to i don't know try to be part of whatever's happening i just feel my my internal monologue is screaming just just don't laugh if you don't think it's funny don't laugh it's okay to not laugh. See, but now you saying it, I'm like, I'm like, wait, and now I'm like being hypercritical. I'm like, does that hit the level where it's okay for me to go from a smile to an actual laugh? I think the thing for each of us is to try to try to find the place where we don't feel like we have to laugh unless we think it's funny. And I don't know, maybe the, the catch 22 is if you put that in someone's head, now they're deeply inside their head in a way that makes really laughing harder because now you're overthinking it and you can't, (laughs) I don't know. Well, it's not even, it's, I think it's, (laughs) I think it's not even like, am I feel like this? It's all of a sudden now there's this like rogue thought in my head of wait, is, is my laugh normal? Because I don't think I'm a normal person. (laughs) Mm. I, I, I guess it's also tough too, because you're a personality and a host and your, your job is like performative And I guess I'm not really thinking so much about hosts and person and and like performers. I'm thinking about like a party situation or when you're just talking to someone that I guess, I guess the broader thing is it's a pet peeve of mine when someone is being performative Mm. in a real conversation that I'm having with them. And I feel like the most, the the biggest example of that is when you're friends with a stand up comedian and you can tell that they're they're testing out material on you that you're becoming a sounding board for their their hot their you know nice 15 what's it hot 15s oh, i don't 15? know i'm not yeah i don't remember <laughs> i uh yeah uh, i feel i feel like the only time i'm performative of act- is actually with smaller like or no in uh conversations with strangers that are not in like an industry i might i'm familiar with 
Like if mm-hmm. uh, if we go back to to Georgia to hang out with uh, my wife's family, and it's like, oh, there's a bunch of people from this nice area, and they're affluent, and they have these other careers, and I'm just like, what the fuck do I talk about with these people? And so yeah. I've had to just pick up pick up small tricks to to just keep things moving so it's not completely obvious that it is a painful conversation for me to have that's fair yeah and you're just doing that out of love for your wife you're maintaining and just you're basically trying to survive and tread water in an uncomfortable situation yeah because you don't want you know yeah you don't want like oh Lindsay's husband's (laughs) ridiculous it was like yeah yeah I've I've got my girlfriend's family from Arizona most of whom are really nice people and I would say maybe half of them are, we don't see politically eye to eye. And sure. then there's one of them who is just, he is just a troll and it's just like survival. I feel like I'm in a foxhole or something trying to just like not be the one who gets picked on at the the family meal and stuff. <laughs> wait, wait, do you mean, do you mean like in the sense of like tr- they try to egg you on and do a fight or something? Uh, I think because I was the new boyfriend at the last, mm. uh, thing I, I had like a, a pass or something that the next holiday I come to the gloves are going to be off a little bit more with him in particular. Uh, but he, he's the kind of person who says some just outlandish stuff to try to see how far he can push it. And everybody else doesn't want to step in because nobody wants to, you're basically entering the line of fire. If you try to defend the person who's being made fun of. Yeah. You're just like, okay, I can't just, this isn't just me making a response. This is the next 10 to 30 minutes of my life at minimum. Yeah, or maybe the next ten to thirty years of your life. No, could man. Be a nickname that no. sticks with you. <laughs> this is this is this is why I don't fucking go to a lot of things. I don't go to a lot yeah. of things. But I also I, I've realized that like uh, family then has to navigate. So I went one of the last times we went back for Thanksgiving. I overheard. Uh, I think it was my stepmom saying the rest of the family is just like everyone on your fucking best behavior. We love that. Yeah, Philly's here. <laughs> I was like, I was like, okay, I guess maybe, maybe this is how I want. Maybe I want like that sanitized experience. So I don't have to, cause I, cause like I was kind of saying, I feel like I've been changing over the past few years. I was definitely way more confrontational when I found something that I found to be trollish or just outright in your face ignorance. But then I think I've come to realize, especially locally, how many times has a fight ended where someone's like, yeah, you're right. No, yeah. fucking never. I've never had that experience with a, a family member or like friend of the family. It just doesn't exist. And now I mean, adults these days, we have are so steeped in our opinions and changing someone's mind on something that's that fundamental to their soul. I feel like that needs to come from their own life experience or something. Just a, a dinner table argument is not going to turn a Republican to a Democrat or a Christian to an atheist or something. I'm going to, I'm going to switch this. Let's see. Describe George, describe an experience that made you realize you were on the wrong path at the time. Hmm. I'm going to try to come up with something that I haven't talked about yet. Let me see some experience. That made me think I was on the wrong path at the time. Um, I mean that one in London was, was like just the absolute biggest watershed Mm-hmm. One that in the last 10, 10 years that I talked about, but I'm sure there's other examples of that. Uh, I'll just give a like a kind of stupid specific one that doesn't seem wise and like overarching because it's popping into my head right now. Sure, yeah. Uh, but I um, do a lot of production on my own music videos. And a few years ago, I was carrying these really big sheets of... Uh, wood and plexiglass that were production pieces for the music video in the back of a pickup truck that I'd rented. And they were like 12 feet tall and cantilevered over the back of the cab of the truck. So the bottom of the, these big sheets was down, uh, where the, the tongue of the pickup truck is. And then the top of them was, was going up diagonally over the cab of the truck. And I got on the freeway with these four, huge pieces and I hadn't ratcheted them down tight enough. And this was at like 1 AM at night and the wind blew them off the back of the the truck. All of a sudden I saw that they were all missing. And these were huge pieces of wooden plexiglass that all of a sudden were on the middle of the five in LA with 
semi-heavy traffic going past them, these giant things I just dropped onto the freeway. And I, I thought in that moment, I'm, I'm going to kill someone. Like I, I, I've just, I've just caused death. And I pulled over to the side of the freeway and I was flipping the fuck out. Uh, and I, and I was like, I, I need to be, I can't just leave. It feels unsafe for me to be on the shoulder right now, but I also can't get off the freeway and just leave the situation. Like I'm responsible for whatever happens here. So whatever it is, I gotta, I gotta watch it or help or something. And, um, miraculously all these semis and stuff, they were honking and swerving. They just smashed it into smithereens and, and it was this colorful plexiglass and it just created this rainbow dust that kind of floated over the whole freeway. Uh, and I don't know how nobody crashed, how it didn't, it like, like wow. people swerved and didn't hit each other. There was no accident. Uh, and I just felt so grateful that like I, I knew that that would have changed the path of my life. I would have felt so guilty. Mm. I, it, I would never feel confident again if I'd felt responsible for killing someone. Uh, and I felt like I'd been granted this mulligan and that the, the lesson I took from that, I took two lessons. One is just truck and automobile safety. <laughs> like if you're driving a truck, if you have something in the back of it, you need to fucking ratchet it down so tight. Like, and you are, also you, you are should, a danger to society is what I've learned over this podcast. I mean, I have been, I, I, I think what it is, is that I'm, I take risks and, and in my life I haven't, it's been a process of learning how to only take risks that are risks to me and not risks to the society around me that you can't be reckless that like all these lessons have really added up to teach me that okay, go out, be, be badass, like go and do cool things, but make sure those risks are limited to you. And that, that is another moment at which I think I took a step back and was like, I, I can't move too fast. Do your safety checks. Be, be like an adult who's not wreaking havoc in the world. Well, I think, I think learning how to gauge everything that's, that's, yeah, that's definitely part of growing up. And, and like yeah. and maturing and evolving. I get that. So actually on the note of risk then, what would you say are your, kind of your biggest achievements in life? Let's say three. We were, three is like the magic number. Um, I'm proud of my, my biggest tangible goal when I started touring was to play the Fillmore, which was my dream venue uh, growing up. It was the place I went to go see concerts as a kid in San Francisco and, and I played it and sold it out and it was one of the best nights of my life. Um, I think, I mean, if I, I don't have a kid, so I don't have to say that having a kid was one of my greatest achievements. <laughs> you get to pass that one. I, I, yeah, I, I get to still have another couple ones. Um, I, I was on this TV show called Deaf Poetry Jam that I dreamed of being on for years. And that was a big goal of mine. And I think just an over, so those are two specific ones. And then I'll have my last one be a broader one, which is I'm really proud of in the years since I first went viral and started building an audience that I've been able to not pigeonhole myself into being the fast rapper or being the funny guy or being the nerdy guy. Like I'm a nerd, but I'm not a nerd with a capital N. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not. I'm not defined by one trait and I don't feel defined or limited in my career. I don't feel like I have an audience that is demanding me to like dance for them in a way that limits myself. I feel like I've, I've been able to uh, develop an audience that lets me take risks creatively and be myself and go away for long periods of time and then come back and still have them there. And I think that being able to cultivate that and have an audience that, that is so kind and, and reflects the values that I want to see in the world is like one of the things I'm most proud of. What do you think is the, the secret to your success? Um, hard work. I work really, really hard. I never stop working. Uh, I, I'm pretty resilient. I think I've tried to take those lessons that I've learned about things I was doing wrong and take them to heart about recklessness. You know, I try to own up to my mistakes you know, when I've done these things publicly, when they've been disasters, I've tried to own them and not run away from them and, and use the lessons that I turned as 
or, or that I brought from them as ways to grow up. And, um, and I think, yeah, maybe those two things be, be the, like the core of my philosophy has been for 15 years or as long as I've been making art to, to work hard, to be kind and to be yourself. I mean, those are like the, the pillars of my philosophy. And, um, I think that those lessons have really served me well. I think that's, that's really healthy. Cause I feel like we definitely live in a time where it's incentivized to never publicly acknowledge failure um, because we have like a, a very bully pile on. I just want to see you sorry, but I don't even fucking care sort of mentality. Yeah. So, but I, uh, for you, but, but still there, I feel like there's so much personal gain from if you, if you legitimately think and know you did something wrong to, uh, to engage it. Um, sure. Wonsky, what's a, what do you think is an impression that people have about you that is wrong? Um, I don't know because I try to be like, I, I try to put it, put it all out there for the most part. Um, I can't, I can't really think of one. I, I feel like in the past there's been some of those impressions that I've tried to get rid of like that. I'm, I'm just one thing or another mm-hmm. and I don't, I don't feel like that at this moment. Um, people don't know that I'm a passable salsa dancer. <laughs> really? when did you, uh, yeah. when did you learn? Uh, 20, 2006 and seven, Why is that? five, six and seven. I took lessons. Why'd you take lessons? Yeah. Because I, I could get out of my gym requirement in <laughs> high school. <laughs> Wait, is it like a, an offsite thing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to, I, I one sem- one trimester I'd play baseball. One, I would take a, I would be in the play, which would somehow give me PE credit. And then the third one, I would take dance lessons. And then I took a year off after high school and lived in San Francisco. And my girlfriend at the time, uh, was also already a salsa dancer. This is either coincidence or the reason we got together. I, I don't know, but, uh, we started dancing together. I have and... like, I have this negative association with salsa dance. So when I lived, uh, God, I forget what state at this point, but when a, a girlfriend before my wife, um, was like, yeah, we got to go salsa dancing. And I think we went two times and I've just always associated a negative thing with it because we ended up not dancing together. And Mm -hmm. I was like, (laughs) I was like, I'm pretty sure she wants to fuck the dude teaching her how to, how to dance instantly. Uh, Every time (laughs) this, this micro, this, this plays out in every salsa community everywhere, I think, because when I would go dancing with, with my girlfriend at the time, who was a much better dancer than me. And I I had like five minutes of moves and then I could repeat them, (laughs) but they weren't great. I wasn't one of these flashy, amazing leaders who was just bubbling sex and, We'd go out to the club and she, and she would get tired of dancing with me. And then she'd get asked to dance by one of the really good guys who had four unbuttoned buttons on his shirt and like cowboy boots on. And there are just these these guys out there that this is their game. They pick women up or or I don't know, or I'm just threatened by it or a combination. Of it's two. probably a combination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then there's also these like short short kings who otherwise wouldn't probably be pulling lots of women, but are just amazing dancers. They do like a quadruple spin and then stop the girl with their foot. And like, you know, this is very threatening. And then I would, I'd be like, Oh yeah, yeah. Go, go dance with him. I'll, I'll find someone else to dance with. And I'd wander around with my, my gin and tonic and chicken out from asking anyone to dance and then sit down and wait for her to be done. (laughs) <laughs> oh man. Wait, so when was the last time do you think that you've, you've kind of like shown off the skill? Oh man, it's been years. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, I, I can't haven't, I sometimes when a like salsa song comes on in the privacy of my home, I'll, I'll get my hips moving. Just for and you. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> for me to enter, entertain my girlfriend, like we'll, we'll dance a little bit in the kitchen, but like, I don't know. I, I think I've never publicly salsa danced like in a video or you know, would you in, consider, in a, do you think that, do you dance in general or are you, cause a lot, I know that like a lot of people are like, I don't know, at least for a while it felt like there's a lot of people, uh, that are like, Oh, I'm too cool for that. And I feel like in the past five years, especially, I don't know if it's like the, the TikTokification of everything. It feels like yeah. it's way more normal for, and like encouraged and, uh, for, for people to dance. Uh, and yeah. cause I remember like if I, when I was growing up in North Carolina, if I wanted to dance, it would have just been 
fucking stupid bigots calling me gay <laughs> for years and years and years. Uh, but now it's like it feels like if way more open. I mean, I love dancing. Yeah. I love going out and dancing with my friends. I don't think I'm good enough to like dance on TikTok or something, but I have major respect. Like that guy, Casey Frey. Do you follow? Dude, his Casey Frey is fucking amazing. He's amazing. He's amazing. And he's so funny. And he's such a good dancer. And uh, I think that, I don't know. He's, I'm sure not the only one. God, there's, he, he works with someone else who's also a really good dancer who does, does that stuff. I know, I know a um, lot of people know him from kind of like that main video, but yeah, I, I followed him because of it, but, and about, I don't know what the fuck it is about that video. That's so <laughs> entrancing that you're like, I will watch this on repeat. I don't know why. Yeah. No, he's, he, he's, I, he, I have a message from him because I, I looked him up and then I realized he'd messaged me in like 2011 mm -hmm. asking me to collaborate with him on a dance video. And I did, I, I didn't respond to it. And I just, you know, if you want to talk about two career mistakes, the, the first one is the, the stage type and the other one is not responding to him with that message because clearly he's been doing this for almost 10 years. And, and, and he just asked at that time, he wasn't a comedian. He was just dancing. He was dancing before he was doing comedy. And, uh, you know, I think what it's shown is that being able to be physical is, I mean, look at Jim Carrey. Yeah. He's not a dancer, but, but physicality is, is such a tool for comedy and entertainment. Wait, so did you end up, when you saw that he messaged you, did, did you then message him? Um, it was, it wasn't a message. It was just an, a tweet adding me oh. and, uh. Yeah, it wasn't a DM, so I, I did, and did not respond to his nine-year-old <laughs> you, did, you didn't tweet. want to publicly respond to his nine-year-old tweet? Hey, hey, yeah, now that you've blown up and, and are, like, much bigger than I am, I'm finally down for this collaboration in no kind there's, of self There's a way, lot of ways so I could look wrong, but how dare it? How dare this not be a thing? Casey Frey, contact Watsky right now. If you happen yeah, to get to, to the very me. fucking <laughs> end of this podcast, <laughs> thank you for watching the rest of it. No. I'm not expecting that, but I will say I, I would like it to be out in the world that it would, you know, you hit me up. I, I, I'm sorry if I didn't see it or respond at the time, but you're fucking funny and talented as shit. So keep dancing, bro. All right. So since, since, uh, wow, we've almost been, almost been talking about, uh, an hour and a half. Is there, are there any last things that you want to hit on just since if you, you have the, you have me, which is not special, uh, but it is very, special. but no, like a, we've, we have a long relationship. So thank you for, for continuing to have me on over the years. How, this how is long like, has it been? Cause I like one of the first memories I have is when I brought you in for a source fed interview, like, uh, but I, but you started showing my stuff to your, your, uh, audience before that, like going back 10 years or something like nine years. It's yeah. yeah Cause I remember getting a boost from your world Right, at least in 2012, probably 2011. No, yeah, I don't doubt that. I uh, I, yeah. I try to showcase a lot of people that are uh, really, really talented uh, in, in a lot of different ways, but I'm trying to think of what it would have been. Trying to fuck. I mean, I did SourceFit, I did Table Talk, I've, I've done a few of those over the years. Yeah, no, but I'm trying to think uh, of like the first time that I would have promoted you. I don't know, it's been so long. But in that yeah. way, it's been like, it's been very cool to see you specific, you specifically but also a lot of people grow like uh yeah. just because it's and i think it also kind of speaks to the point of you never you never know like where someone's gonna end up right and i mean i can say the same thing back to you i mean you've been doing this for a long time now and you've continued to have this huge audience and and when we started everybody thought you know okay youtube is going to be one of these flash in the pan mm. platforms gonna be gone in three years or something and the next thing will take its place and and i think you know you are one of the great not only survivors but thrivers of the internet it's that's pretty fucking cool thank you man i uh i'm <laughs> as much as i always focus on the negative i'm always super super thankful for it but i think i think the reason it's it's a little bit of exhausting is i just this many years in and i know that it, it's very it would be very easy to dismiss just to be like oh you're just looking for something uh, but it's like, it's something I've been trying to grapple with is I still don't, I don't fully get why when I, when I put out stuff like I did, uh, the week that we're filming this and I feel like I really accomplished something both on, uh, an entertainment separately, but then a really important, like, here's what's happening. Here's why you need to care. Uh, tr like that sort of thing. I feel like, okay, I get it a little bit, <laughs> but yeah. that I give myself that moment and then I'm, I'm back to, 
I, I don't know. I, something I said on uh, the video, I think we're just so, you know, we're sentient piles of meat. I don't, I don't, it, it's, it's not that big. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm good to keep, keep that mentality. Um, I'm going to take this last moment to plug a couple things. Do it. Yes. Uh, one, one of which is charity and one of which is personal. Uh, so that fundraiser that I ran is technically not over and my, the money's been distributed now to the fans and ba band and crew, but any money that, that rolls in continues to go to the 501 C three nonprofit that we partnered with sweet relief and any of the money that they collect goes to paying the bills of disabled musicians and, and musicians who otherwise can't work. So, uh, if you're interested in donating specifically to musicians impacted by COVID, these are not my people, uh, you know, my band and crew, but they're deserving folks. You can still donate at watskyrelief.com and uh, it, it is going to go to people in a really impactful way. And uh, also, if you're interested in personally supporting me in some way, my tour is on sale crazily, stupidly uh, for the spring of 2021. And if you want to buy a ticket, you can view it like buying a war bond. That's specifically for me. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I, I cannot guarantee you that this show will happen as planned, but if it doesn't, we won't keep your money indefinitely. Uh, but you know, it, it goes to support us and, and the idea that this will happen at some point, you, you can go to George .com and the tour dates for all 40 dates are up there and, you can buy them and support our, our squad and throw a little vote of confidence our way. If it's still not happening in 2021, there are bigger problems. <laughs> People get in now. Yeah. Get in. Absolutely. Now. Get in on the ground floor. There are a couple shows that are actually sold out or close to selling out. Damn. So that's awesome. Go figure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Dude, George, thank you for the time. I appreciate you. I know, I know you're, you get, you, you have other things to do, but I appreciate you doing the 90 minutes. It was a, t it was a total pleasure. Love it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah.